Thank you all for joining us virtually for this Scale School event, Perspectives on Startup Acquisitions, hosted by Venture Lab and Lifelong Learning. I'm Lori Rosenkopf, the Vice Dean of Entrepreneurship at the Wharton School, and it's great to have you with us today. Our program today will be led by Assistant Professor Danny Kim, whose research interests in the areas of high growth entrepreneurship, strategic management, and mergers and acquisitions will frame today's discussion. And Professor Kim will be joined by our esteemed panelist, Gary Johnson, who's Wharton grad 08. Gary is the founder and managing partner of Cocoa Ventures, and he's formerly the global head of strategy, business and corporate development at Pinterest. We're also joined by Rich Riley, who's Wharton grad 96, and Rich is the co-CEO of Origin Materials, and he's the former CEO of Shazam. How will today's Scale School program work? We'll start with teachings from Professor Kim, and it will continue with a discussion between Danny and our panelists, and then we'll conclude with questions and answers. So feel free to ask questions in the chat throughout the program if you want to participate in that portion. And now, I'll turn the program over to Danny. All right, thank you, Lori, and welcome everyone. I'm delighted to welcome back our alumni and to be able to discuss startup acquisitions with you all. Uh, to give you a sense of where we are headed, I'm going to be starting us off with a brief primer on our understanding of startup acquisitions, which are when established companies like Intel and Google go on to buy out startup companies. I'll then uh, showcase new research insights based on cutting edge research on this topic, We'll then bring in our two panelists to provide a perspective on both the buyers and sellers in these acquisitions. So to get us started, the past few decades have shown a dramatic increase in startups being acquired by established companies. So in this figure here, I'm plotting the share of venture capital backed startups that are exiting successfully, that is liquidating through an IPO, which has been the traditional home run outcome for startups, or through an uh, acquisition. As you can see here, acquisitions have become the dominant channel uh, through which startup companies are choosing to exit. What this trend reflects is a changing competitive landscape where large firms are looking at startup companies as a source of growth and renewal. And exactly what are these benefits of buying out a nascent company? Well, most often startup acquisitions are motivated by new technology that established companies can bring in rather than develop them in-house. This is going to give you a window onto the next generation of breakthrough technologies. Consider the approach of Google, uh, who is a major player in this space. As you can see in this infographic here, they've done more than 250 acquisitions since their founding in 2001. Beyond their search business, pretty much all of their growth has come from acquisitions like YouTube, Android, Nest, and so forth. Second, acquiring startups will be a way to eliminate competition before they, became, uh, they become a bigger threat. And while companies don't readily admit this, recent research has shown evidence of this by revealing that in some acquisitions, the buyer shuts down the target firm and their product immediately after the acquisition. From a policy perspective, this has raised many, many concerns around the anti-competitive effects of startup acquisitions. In fact, the Federal Trade Commission launched an investigation into the largest buyers in this space with allegations that they're harming the competitive landscape. And while policy won't be the main focus of our conversation today, this is a very important piece to keep in mind as you see this play out in the media and around us. Third, startup acquisitions can be an important source of new talent that is going to be harder to perhaps higher in traditional labor markets. And the benefit here is that you're gonna bring in a team that is already proven to work together effectively. This has led to a phenomenon called acquihiring, where companies are looking to harness new talent from startup companies. And echoing this view, Mark Zuckerberg once said, Facebook has not once bought a company for the company itself, we buy companies to get excellent people. Now, despite all of these apparent benefits, startup acquisitions in reality have done poorly, uh, both from a financial and strategic perspective. So why might that be? Well, we have to remember that unlike two large companies that are merging, uh, generating synergies with combining their large asset bases, 
startups are inherently an asset light business that are a people driven business. What that means is their value is really rooted in the people and less so in other assets like physical property or even patents and distribution channels. The tricky thing here is unlike other assets, people cannot be purchased and owned outright because they could actually just walk away from the firm any day. So what that gives us a world in which the returns from acquiring a startup is going to critically depend on your ability to actually retain these employees after the acquisition. So how effective are startup acquisitions as a hiring strategy? In my recent research, I examined this question uh, using population level data from the US Census Bureau uh, to study startup employees acquired by large firms. I then compared these acquired workers to people who are traditionally hired by that same acquiring firm in that same year. So for instance, this would be comparing people that Google brings in through acquisitions versus those that they individually hire as a comparison group. Then I track these two groups of workers over time and see their retention patterns. So here is a baseline look of what retention looks like for these regular hires over time. Uh, by construction, the retention rate here is set to 100% in year zero, and it kind of falls over time. Roughly half of these workers are gone after three years. So even among regular hires, there's an enormous amount of churn that happens. Overlaid on top of that are acquired workers from startups. They are so much more likely to leave, especially in that first year after the acquisition, which is actually striking because this is the time when there are financial incentives to stay like stock options with the vesting schedule and so forth. But overall, what we're seeing in the data is that acquired talent exhibits a much higher turnover rate than traditional hires. So what can companies do to mitigate this issue? Well, one critical decision that every acquisition you have to make is whether to leave the acquired firm in that original place or bring it in, 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 in uh, into the headquarters of the acquiring firm to integrate the two organizations. For example, as shown here, uh, when Amazon acquired a robotic startup called Kiva Systems in Massachusetts, they decided to leave it alone because moving 3,000 miles would be very disruptive. Now, consistent with this view, when buyers relocate their targeted firms, my data show that the turnover rates of these acquired workers are almost doubled. So while there are clear benefits of integrating by relocating the firm, companies should really carefully weigh this against the higher likelihood of employee turnover. Now, of course, turnover is going to be costly because you have to replace that person, but the real strategic cost of turnover depends on the destinations of these departure patterns. For instance, an employee leaving to switch industry outright versus launching a company to compete against you are totally different elements. So here is a simple breakdown from that data of workers based on whether they leave, their wages as a proxy for seniority at the firm, and where they go if they leave. One striking pattern that I'll highlight here is that compared to regular hires, acquired workers are much more likely to leave for another startup, either as a founder or joiner. Equally as striking is the fact that these people tend to be those with the highest earnings prior to leaving. Like in other words, your best employees from the acquired startups are the ones who are most likely to leave and start new companies. This could be dangerous if these employees are leaving to start rival companies. To really kind of put color in that perspective, consider the case of Eric Yuan and his founding story of Zoom. So Eric came to Silicon Valley in the 90s to join the internet boom in that region and he joined a young company called WebEx, uh, which was developing this live collaboration software. In 2007, the company got acquired by Cisco and they retained Yuan to become the VP to continue the development of this product. Now, Eric Yuan had a vision that the future of WebEx belonged in a cloud-based platform, but Cisco disagreed because it was already working as it is, they didn't really need, uh, see a need for that progression. So with frustration, after years of trying, uh, Eric Yuan left the company with more than 40 engineers with him from Cisco and then launched Zoom in 2012. At its IPO in 2019, it was leading as the leading competitor to Cisco's 
WebEx. Now here is a formal test of this Eric Yuan hypothesis, if you will, which is that acquisitions are going to trigger startup employees to leave and start their own companies. To do this, I ran a series of regression analyses on startup employees' likelihood of leaving to start their own companies for each year before and after the acquisition. As you can see in the plot, just to summarize, before the acquisition, which is the vertical red line, that effect is basically zero. But after, these people's likelihood of leaving and starting a new company goes up two to three X. And many of these companies are in the same industry and region as the prior employer. And what that tells us is that startup acquisitions are leading to the creation of new competitors in this landscape. So let me just close out by showing you that yes, this is the first research to really systematically link this, but this phenomenon is not necessarily new. So consider the biotech cluster in San Diego with which many of you are probably familiar. So in 1978, Hybrid Tech was the first ever biotech startup in San Diego. Uh, it was acquired by Lilly in 1986 to capture this rapidly merging market in diagnostics testing. And inside this newly combined organization after the acquisition, there are so many disagreements around managerial practices, product development and know-how, leading most of these hybrid tech engineers and senior managers to revolt by leaving the firm. Leveraging their knowledge of hybrid tech diagnostics technology, many of these departing employees went on to start their own biotech startups in that region. Consequently, Lilly's acquisition of hybrid tech failed to materialize due to a key uh, talent that was being lost uh, with these departures. Instead, hybrid tech alumni went on to launch many related companies in the region, including Amelin, Nanogen, and others, ultimately seeding the San Diego biotech cluster. Now there are more than 400 biotech companies in the region that could trace their roots back to this original acquisition of hybrid tech. So by now, I hope you're seeing not only the benefits of acquiring a startup, but also the challenges, most notably the struggle to keep the best talent from leaving the firm after the acquisition. So let me now turn it over to our panel discussion where we have our two rock star panelists with deep expertise in startup acquisitions. So first uh, we have Rich Riley to tell us about the seller's perspective. Rich is currently the CEO of Origin Materials, which is an energy tech company capturing carbon and transforming it into durable goods. Uh, before this, he was with Shazam and LogMeon.com, which were acquired by Apple and Yahoo. Rich, thank you for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. All right. Next, we have Gary Johnson, uh, currently the founder of Cocoa Ventures, who will give us a uh, buyer's perspective on um, this uh, phenomenon. And prior to this, he served as the global head of strategy at Pinterest and senior director of corporate development and Facebook, where he championed many successful startup acquisitions. So Gary, thank you for being here with us. Thanks for having me. Okay, so let me make sure our videos are centered here. Um, what I'm gonna do is start us off with a couple of questions for both um, our panelists here. We'll also monitor the chat so we, we could actually you know, integrate your questions uh, into our discussion. So Rich, if you don't mind, let me start with you today, uh, the seller's perspective in startup acquisitions. So you founded your first company, LogMeon.com, back in 98, uh, sold to Yahoo later on. What was the company about? Tell us briefly. And, and how did you know Yahoo would be a good fit as an acquiring company for your startup? Yeah, so I had uh, graduated from Morton undergrad, went to Wall Street and partnered with my, my good friend in, in the IT group at my investment bank. And next thing you know, we had... Um, figured out how to make a browser, a toolbar persistent in a browser. And as soon as we figured that out, we immediately filed a patent and realized that this would be much more powerful if part of a much larger platform. And so we identified three potential acquirers. We figured out our best way in so that we'd have a warm intro to the, to the right people at those companies. And I would, I would highly recommend that. We also um, created a pretty extensive mock-up to connect the dots and show Yahoo, for example, what would this technology look like potentially if Yahoo, if it was part of Yahoo and, and, and really try to make it easy for them to see the, the, the possibility. 
And, um, and we were fortunate that um, several of them uh, engaged and um, we ended up uh, choosing Yahoo. And a lot of it was cultural fit. Uh, we it was just sort of a love fest. We um, we we really liked them. We really liked their approach to the acquisition, and we were confident that um, that Yahoo would be a great home for our for our small company. This is excellent. Thank you very much for that perspective. Let me actually now go over to um, the buyer's perspective uh, with Gary here. So before founding Kokua, you were um, having a prolific career at Facebook, where you championed many many successful startup acquisitions. So a uh, question for you is while we recognize every deal is so different, uh, when you're kind of considering many acquisitions to take on, how did your team make the decision of which startup to acquire versus which startup to not acquire? What were some of that criteria? Yeah, yeah it's a great question. Um, you know, truth be told, I actually think that um, doing this job, the job being that of a buyer in M&A actually just comes down to two questions, <laughs> not to not to belittle it, but I, I actually think they're really hard to answer. Uh, and these were the questions that we always held up as the sort of gold standard when we were thinking about buying businesses or anyone that I would advise about uh, pursuing an acquisition. And I'm sure it's what Yahoo did actually with Rich as well, which is figure out what you're trying to achieve. Like, what is it? Why are you pursuing this? Um, your slide earlier kind of alluded to this. I call it the four T's. Acquisitions tend to fall into one of four categories, talent, technology, traction, or terrain. The, and by terrain, I don't mean geography. I mean orthogonal new markets. Um, and you know, at the time at Facebook, I think a lot of the acquisitions, as you alluded to as well, uh, fell into those first two categories of talent and technology, where we were looking to fulfill a gap that we couldn't otherwise fill in our strategy. Um, one of just a high level example of what that might look like. Everyone's talking about the metaverse these days. Facebook has renamed itself to meta. Um, at the time in 2015, no one had probably heard of the word outside of those walls. Um, and there was a little company called Surreal Vision. And Surreal Vision uh, was founded by a professor actually um, at Imperial College and University of Washington, a guy named Richard Newcomb. And without him and without his technology, a lot of the things that we're going to experience and envision today in AR wouldn't be possible. And we needed talent like that. I think the quote that I received from our chief scientist at the time was, there is no one else in the world on this planet that can solve this problem better than Richard. And um, you know that was a big driver for, for that acquisition. But usually they fall into one of those four categories and you're trying to fill a gap. The second question, since I left it hanging there was, what's the most efficient way to achieve those goals? So once you've identified what they are, we would always step back and say, okay, should we do the build by partner, do nothing analysis? And if so, um, you know, let's go after and make sure we run after the very best thing that we could be doing. That's really helpful. Thank you for sharing that. And you know, we're hearing a lot of, I think, good examples of how this might look like if things really click and go well. So uh, Rich's example with Yahoo, that was a great one. And Gary, your examples, I think, are kind of pointing to the successful deals. Now, if we could turn over to not so successful adventures, if you will, to give us more perspective on the full spectrum of how this really could be. Uh, Rich, let me um, start with you, which is you had a second company, uh, Shazam, which was acquired by Apple. Uh, what were some of the biggest changes that you experienced in transitioning to a large company from a startup? And how did your team members also uh, adjust? Yeah, so um, a few things on the Shazam Apple. So one, there was a longstanding relationship between the two companies. And I think a lot of mutual respect, which always makes it easier to, um, to, to go to the next step. And I will say that Apple, like, like a lot of big companies, but they have... Um, extensive M&A capabilities, meaning they have HR teams that just focus on M&A and IT teams. And, um, and, and they've really gotten good at acquiring companies and, and, and facilitating that transition. And so, for example, we spent an enormous amount of time before the acquisition on all the specifics of you know, each, each person, their compensation package, their reporting structure, what would their role be? thinking through what, what, what could be some of the, the things that would be um, challenging. So for example, at Shazam, we would update code on a daily basis. 
right? With very thin approval processes. We were a very nimble startup and it's different at Apple, as you might imagine. And so thinking through how do we take a culture that's used to doing it one way to doing it this other way. Also, when you, when you go into a big company like an Apple, they have um, a lot of the way they do things is different than the way the startup did things and have um, frequently much more strenuous um, security reviews and you know all kinds of things that feel pretty heavy to, to most startups. And so thinking through how do you minimize that friction and at the same time, bringing a lot of benefits. So in the case of, of Shazam, for example, Apple can bring a lot more distribution, a lot more computing power, help make the product better so that our team would feel like, yeah, there's some stuff that's maybe feels like friction and is a little bit annoying, but there's all this really great stuff about helping us um, fulfill our mission and, and, and make this product the best we can. And so it was um, an incredibly smooth transition. Um, and it was uh, one of the first times they've ever kept a brand and a team separate. And, um, and to my knowledge, uh, basically everyone is still there and the product keeps getting better. And uh, it's a, a big success from the perspective of both companies. That's an amazing story because in a counterfactual world in which Suzanne perhaps would not be acquired by Apple, perhaps the company wouldn't have reached that you know, as great of scale because of the resources that Apple could provide in developing a nascent company. That, that's really great. So you actually mentioned the word culture uh, in your earlier remarks. Um, could you talk about maybe cultural integration and cultural clash in either cases of logmeon.com or Shazam of how you might manage that? Or is that something that actually can be managed? Yeah, it's a tricky one in terms of how to manage it. Um, in, in both cases, there was a um, quick cultural fit that we could just feel. I think sometimes it's sort of hard to, you know, sort of assess or, or diagnose or whatever. And um, what was nice in the case of Shazam and Apple, like I said, is we, we've gotten to know them. We got to know each other over, over a lot of years. And so we, we had, you know, good feeling for how, how the other company did things, how they thought about, about us and, and things like that. And so I, I think some of it was making sure that the way you could manage it was in things like approvals and stuff like that, which big companies can be you know, one of the things that can lead startup people to say no thanks and leave the big company is if it's too hard to get their job done and they feel like things are moving too slow, there's too many approvals, I'm not empowered, I can't make decisions like I used to make. And so, you know, working through with a company like Apple, how do we bridge that gap the best we can and, uh, and be as transparent as we can with the teams? And so we, uh, we really manage that as much as possible. We were also fortunate that Apple really loved the Shazam brand and the Shazam product. And they were incredibly complimentary about how we had built a brand and built a product, which by the way is, a, um, I feel like Apple doesn't share, make those kind of compliments lightly. And so our team really went in feeling very special. And I think that helped a lot with the sort of um, cultural connection. And we also decided to keep the team um, integrated the way it was bring it over, maybe over time it would be distributed across various Apple functions, but not to do that immediately because of the risk of that sort of cultural um, combination. So that is very consistent with what I hear when I interview entrepreneurs and, and joiners who then go to big firms of culture and, and how to think about new bureaucracies that get imposed on the team. So, so this is really helpful to hear. So Gary, if I could put you in a spot on the same question, but from the other side uh, as the acquiring firm, how do you think about culture? Because there is clearly an asymmetry here of size, you know, big firm, small firm, but also maybe with power structure. So is culture something that's actually being imposed on the smaller company or is there a process of perhaps making it work together? I think um, at a high level, it is one of the first tests that needs to be sort of crossed. I think of m and I think of acquisitions a lot like marriages and use that analogy a lot. Um, I'm often telling my wife the size of the engagement ring doesn't determine the success of the marriage. Um, and I think that's, um, that holds true for acquisitions as well. I have an acronym um, that I call AIR. Um, it stands for alignment, integration, and rationale. A friend of mine uh, added an F to the front of it to call it FAIR, and the F stands for FIT. Um, but I think every great acquisition that I've ever worked on. And I think the best serial acquirers actually get this and understand this. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do it serially, which is that you need to really be transparent, tactically putting this into sort of what Rich has alluded to with, with the acquisition of Shazam. Um, you need to be transparent about where you want to go together. 
like the, you know, just like a marriage, the places you want to live, the where you want to send your kids to school, whether or not you're going to relocate people or not. I think the bespoke method with which acquirers approach that and the care with which they consider acquisitions, the more successful they'll be. That's the rationale and the alignment piece of this. This is what you read of in the press releases of any deal. You should be able to find that rationale and find the, the alignment. Um, and if you can't, I think that there probably wasn't the fit and it's, it's usually set up for a disaster from the beginning. Um, the second thing is I think you need to collaborate. It sounds like Apple was very good at this. Um, I've been part of some acquisitions when I was there as well uh, before they had a corporate development team. And I know we, we took a lot of care in making sure there was collaboration between our teams, before, kind of a try before you buy, like the dating period, if you will. And then lastly, I think you need to be willing to, to reinvest. Uh, the best acquirers, I think, go about seeing these investments that they're making not as a standalone uh, sort of one-off, um, but actually something that they need to reinvest and surround the team with. And a lot of that comes out of those early conversations around whether or not you truly do have the same vision, the same rationale, and the same alignment uh, with the startups with, with whom you're interacting. Um, but I think those learnings, you know, on the flip side for me, the, the best learnings that I've got um, the two reasons why I see deals fail, the two biggest reason are the deal sponsor or the deal owner leaves the room or they abandon the acquisition, they abandon the marriage, if you will, or the strategy shifts. And in our industry, at least the ones that we're in, the, the industry is shifting so quickly and you're evolving so fast that you know this, there is always an inherent risk that the strategy will change. And that one's kind of outside of your control. Um, but th those two tend to be the biggest reasons why, outside of the cultural sort of fit rejection, why I've seen startups um, fail in their acquisitions. That's really helpful. So I guess to take your knowledge further, that process before marriage, that this dating process before the acquisition of really trying to figure out, is this person or company a good match for me? I would love to hear from both sides, actually. How do you figure out? Uh, that potential fit or match? I mean, what are the questions you should ask? What are some signs you should look for in terms of perhaps red flags in terms of match quality? Um, was there ever a consideration of those elements? Uh, maybe with you, Rich, first of selling your company to a larger company. Yeah, I think it's um, it's being transparent and collaborative. So, you know, in the case of LogMeOn, we wanted that, that technology to be um, used by as many millions of people as possible and for it to be a, you know, very wide open. So obviously if the acquirer had wanted to make it a, put it behind a paywall or something like else, we might've had a, a big disconnect before we even got going. And, and similarly at, at Shazam, you know, our internal um, sort of value statement was deliver magic together. And so we were in the magic business. And so an acquirer that didn't wanna make the product better every day and have it used as ubiquitously as possible was, was gonna be a really tricky fit for the way our, our organization thought about itself and thought about what it was trying to accomplish. And so I think to, um, to Gary's point, you know, making sure you have a lot of alignment around some of those top level North stars early on is, um, is really critical or you're probably in for a lot of pain. I just um, continuing on that. Uh, you mentioned the word magic. It was the uh, 10 year anniversary this past weekend of the Instagram acquisition. Um, I think everyone knows about the magic that happened there. I'm not, I don't want to allude to that one, but actually an acquisition that's lesser known that Instagram actually did of a company um, called Luma or Midnox to get into the video space. So back in 2013, um, which is a long time ago as well, uh, there wasn't video in Instagram. There weren't stories, there weren't boomerangs. And Kevin Systrom having the vision and foresight that he did, he wanted video to look as magical as as the square photos that were in instagram and he said we need to do this quickly i remember this vividly it was memorial day weekend of 2013 um we didn't have the time to build a relationship we wanted to launch the product by the end of june so we had less than a month to find an acquisition to integrate it and to launch a product in in time for instagram's inaugural video product launch and that was a challenge, as you might imagine, there weren't that many startups um, working on what Kevin thought would be a magical video experience, but we found a company in Palo Alto of all places at a school that I won't mention on this uh, conference um, coming out of their st startup accelerator. And 
there was clear alignment. We built a relationship quickly with the founders, similar to you, Rich. They wanted to see their product in hundreds of millions of people's hands. It wasn't about the price tag. It was about them seeing that there could be this realization that their technology may not reach a couple hundred thousand people, but a hundred, couple hundred million people overnight. And uh, that company you know, went on to you know, integrate and build lots of products like Hyperlapse and Boomerang and lots of things. And actually, eventually, one of them is still at the company, but it was three brothers that started it. Uh, so a pretty magical story. One of them is still there and the others have gone on to found other companies. It's really refreshing to hear a new perspective of an Instagram acquisition. I mean, we hear about it a lot, but and when that deal was announced, I think a lot of us were scratching our heads of, with the price tag. And I think knowing how it has turned out, this has to be one of the most successful acquisitions of all time. So it's really interesting to hear about that one. Um, so Gary, while I have you, I would love to kind of follow up on a conversation of employee turnover. So as the data showed, really high rates of turnover both the founders and joiners, perhaps engineers and managers as well. So from the buyer's perspective, um, what, were your, what was your experience like? I mean, how much of this was anticipated versus unexpected? And if there are any kind of key personnel, what kinds of talent are you looking more towards retaining versus others? I think the... Um, seeing your charts actually was was really validating and refreshing at the same time. Um, I've done similar analyses inside of a few companies now, and I tend to find uh, similar statistics, which is that in, in the case of aqua hires or talent acquisitions or whatever you might call them, um, what we found is two things. You tend to overpay for them. Um, people tend to attrit earlier. They tend to leave the company sooner than regular employees. And the third one, which is more of an in-house statistic than an out-of-house is that they tend to actually underperform in performance reviews relative to their peers. So you're overpaying for underperformance and early attrition. That's a great conversation to have with your CFO when you wanna go and pursue one of these. Um, it's great to be rich on the other side. <laughs> um, but I think the important point to also understand is that the data tends to be of a very large data set, at least for serial acquirers. And within that data, you have the outliers. And those outliers tend to de deliver a significant amount of value to the company if done correctly and if identified correctly, that far outweighs any cost or premium you might be paying or, or you know, attrition or HR costs that might go to mitigate or manage. Uh, you know, any type of failed integration, if you will. Um, but those, those, that data does very much hold, and I've worked with folks from other companies that were in your slides as well, and I think we all see the same thing. So why do you do them? You do them because I call it you buy to build. You're acquiring someone with a core competency, with a motivation that's clearly aligned with a strategic gap that you have, and you know not how to fill it. Um, it reminded me of the best, the, the purest example I could find was from a company that I'd worked on acquiring back in 20, I think 14 or 15, um, Facebook got into the drone business. They, we wanted to launch unmanned aerial solar power satellites that flew at 65,000 feet. And I remember putting together with our HR team, uh, the first offer letter and creating the, the position inside of Salesforce for an aerospace engineer at Facebook, um, <laughs> because we were gonna be building and we acquired a hangar and we were building literally airplanes uh, that we were gonna then shoot laser beams at to bring internet connectivity to parts of the world that had no connectivity. It sounds like science fiction until you see what's happening in the world today uh, with Elon and, and others with Starlink. But at the time, there was this gap, and we were, you know, like surreal vision, um, AI, AR, internet connectivity, you end up paying a premium, where oftentimes you're paying pro professional athlete salaries for talent, but you're getting talent that you otherwise could not get, or you could not attract had you not had this, this need. And that, that need ends up outweighing, in my opinion, any strategic uh, sort of cost that you may see in the sort of early attrition or underperformance from other employees that get added to that pool. Wow. So basically, a, sh a hit, um, small share of these big outlier outcomes will more than pay for these below average um, share of the deals. That's really interesting to hear. Think about the variance, not only the average effects. 
Uh, so, so Rich, if I could go to you, because you are, are a very interesting case study, if you will, because um, in your role at Yahoo after the acquisition, you stayed on for a long time, uh, with Shazam and Apple was much shorter. Uh, just tell us uh, about the rationale of transitioning between companies and the length of time. And maybe you could also speak about your teammates' uh, decision to stay versus leave the acquiring company. Yeah, so I, I joined Yahoo as a... Um director of corporate development. And I was, you know, 25 years old and the internet was just getting going in 1999. And um, basically they would, you know, throw me something new every 18 months and it just kept going and going and going. And I would end up spending 13 years there, including running Europe, Middle East and Africa, running the Americas and being on the executive management team. So, you know, I was employee 799 when, when they acquired us. And when I left, there were like 18,000 yahoos or something like that. So, um, Stayed way longer than I ever would have thought, but they just kept, you know, keeping me challenged, and um, and it was uh, it was a really fun experience. Um, you know, Shazam was a little different. I went in as the CEO, um, ran it for five years when it was acquired by Apple. You know, the opportunities. I was later in my career. Um, Apple it wants people at that level almost entirely are in Cupertino, which is a little bit of a unique um, aspect of, of the way Apple manages things. That wasn't really a, a sort of family reality for me. And so I was had also gotten accustomed to being a CEO and, and really enjoying that role. And um, and so going into more of the, you know, management ranks at Apple just wasn't as attractive for me personally. That being said, I'm incredibly thrilled that the Shazam team is, to my knowledge, entirely at Apple, thriving at Apple. And uh, it really was the right home for that company, which I think for, you know, when you are a seller, you're, you really want to find that right home. Right, and so it's um, it, it's it's been it's been a great outcome for them. That's fantastic. So I have a last question, and we'll then turn it over to our uh, attendees for any kind of open Q and A. So, as you recall, uh, the beginning of my talk, I was showing this increasing trend in acquisitions relative to IPOs for startups. We don't really know what is driving that trend. Uh, the last few decades, I would love to hear if you have any perspectives on what you think is driving this kind of ecosystem towards more acquisitions and fewer IPOs? I'll, I'll kick that one off. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a couple of factors. Um, one is you know, the, the alignment that you're seeing, the, the burden of actually becoming a, a public company yourself, uh, having been at two companies that have gone from private to public and also been in a serial acquirer position. There's, there is a lot that goes into um, getting the company prepared for um, and actually going into becoming a, a public company. It's, it's, it's a fairly rigorous process, um, as Rich knows, we're run, running one. <laughs> and it, there's, I think, you know, also a trend in, in terms of the amount of capital that's been invested in companies um, and the exit opportunities for them. And I think there's also a significant, um, at least in the industries that I'm serving and, and have been fortunate to, to operate in with Rich, is like there's significant amount of capital need and an expansion of opportunity sets within those, those buyers for those buyers to need assets that are going to be exited. So I, I think it's a couple of factors, but the two biggest drivers I think are you know, the, the amount of capital available and also the strategic need for those buyers to be deploying capital to grow their, their own businesses as well. And I'll just add that I think, um, you know, companies have gotten really good at it. And so, you know, I, I think Apple buys several companies a month that we just don't hear about, but they've got, you know, to, to Gary's sort of mantra of they know what they're looking for. They know um, what they want out of deals. They know how to make them work. And, and it's a, you know, it's a core part of their strategy is where, you know, in the earlier days of tech, it was, you know, I think more opportunistic and, you know, much more sort of like uh, learning as we went, but, the, but these, these companies have, have really institutionalized uh, being able to do this successfully. So on both sides, I guess, of the coin, we have myriad of factors that are contributing to this. Okay, that's really helpful to hear. Uh, we do have a series of questions that are coming in from our, our um, alumni. One question uh, that is really interesting is, why did the two of you go into your respective roles in terms of seller or buyer side? Have you ever tried the other side? Uh, if so, why did you end up choosing the side you are with today? 
Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start. So, I mean, when you're an entrepreneur, you're sort of, um, you know, at, at some point you're likely to exit. So you are, you are in the seller's role um, with responsibility to your investors and your team and, and, and everything else. I actually, when I went to Yahoo, I actually did do corporate development for a while. So got to be on the, on the other side of it and, and experience that as well. And so it's, it's, it's great to see both sides and speak both, both languages, but um, I don't know. I, just, I think more as an entrepreneur, you're, you're, you're likely to, to want to at least understand how the sell side works. Um, similar to Rich, I had a different role back in the day when I was at Apple. I was actually building things. I was an engineer on several different product teams. So um, what I realized at one point was that every single product that I was working on started with an acquisition. And so including the very first one, so I, I was building their, their video solutions for a product called Final Cut Pro which became a studio of products that we grew through acquisition. And then I had the fortune in 2005 of working on integrating a technology called multi-touch, which we had acquired from a company called Fingerworks out of the University of Delaware, a PhD student and his professor had built this little thing that we turned into the iPhone and the iPad. And I thought, wow, like everything I'm working on is starting with something that we're acquiring. I want to do that. And unfortunately, Apple at the time didn't have an M&A team at all. Um, the, the, so this was, you know, pre, pre 2009, when Adrian and the group came over from Goldman. Um, and so I needed to rebrand myself. So I went and I actually went to Wharton and <laughs> got, got my MBA um, and went and became an investment banker where I started advising companies on M&A and did that until I landed my gig at Facebook so that I could get back into tech and start doing M&A and knew that that was going to be sort of the I had this vision that it would be sort of like the golden era of um, what Google went through post IPO. And sure enough, uh, what we lived through and what I lived through was um, pretty, pretty amazing and pretty blessed to be able to do that. So we were, like Rich said, like Apple's doing now at the time, I think there were days when I was signing two term sheets a day, sometimes doing a deal a week. Um, it was, it was uh, the sort of golden era of M&A at that company. I'm really blessed to have that experience. It's interesting that both of you had experiences on both sides of, of this uh, transaction. So that's really fascinating. Um, I have this one question coming in from the chat. Uh, I think this is more geared towards uh, Gary and maybe Rich, uh, also from the buyer's perspective, if you want to take this on too, which is thinking about strategic investments before the acquisition as a way to get a feel for this relationship, and perhaps vet new acquisition targets. So do you ever see this happening? And if so, do you think this is effective? as an experimental kind of approach to acquisitions? I, um, I guess the short answer is I don't. Um, I think truth be told, when you really, uh, when you really step back and look what, at what minority investments or strategic investments get you as an investor, um, not to be blunt about it, but you get equity in exchange for money. Um, that is it. Um, there's certain board rights or certain other motivations that people might have, but rarely are you getting any other insight other than what you would get if you normally just organically built a relationship with that entrepreneur. Um, they like to see that, and Rich can uh, counter this, but I, I think that alignment that you can form with someone does not necessarily have to have dollars behind it. Uh, there's a lot more value that you could deliver as a partner um, through other means of distribution or whatever it might be uh, that don't include dollars and cents. Um, and that dating phase, I think, is, is when you discover that. But I don't think you necessarily need to buy your way into that. Yeah, I, I really agree with that. I, I do think it's important to develop a relationship. But I think to what Gary said, you know, you can, there's a lot of ways to have a meaningful commercial relationship um, without actually uh, an investment. And I think investments bring a bunch of potential unintended consequences around strategic alignment. You may be closing a bunch of doors that you, you know, in hindsight, didn't want to close. And so I'm sure there are um, specific situations where it, it does make sense and it fits. But I, I would say, generally speaking, try to develop a, a commercial relationship. And, you know, if an investment or something comes out of that, maybe it makes sense, but I wouldn't, that wouldn't be my focus. Okay, so the benefits are clear, but also the costs could also be significant in terms of missed opportunities and, and um, other ways of going about building relationships. 
So b- being proactive for buyers, of course, this is one way. Another question comes in being proactive for the sellers. So maybe to you, Rich, what can entrepreneurs do uh, to be proactive in signaling to this market uh, that you would be a great acquisition target? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, your slide made it very clear that acquisition is a likely outcome if your venture and company are successful. Um, And so I think identifying early on who the potential acquirers are, trying to get to know them in, um, in, in as organic fashion as possible, ideally having commercial relationships with them, but, but building those relationships over time, I, I think makes a big difference. It's um, the, the last minute, you know, for whatever reason, they meet you and buy you overnight, that happens, like the example Gary said. But a lot of times, if somebody thinks, I've never heard of you, you're telling me I have, you know, a week to react, you know, it, it's just, I, I think it's a pretty long shot frankly, as where if you've built that relationship, they know you over time and now some circumstances have changed on their side or your side and it makes sense to, to, get to, to do an acquisition, it makes more sense. So as a, as a CEO or a senior member of a company, knowing who your potential acquirers are, building those relationships over time, I think will serve you really well in terms of the eventual outcome. Also in terms of knowing cultural fit and the other things that lead to success. But I think people sometimes underestimate that it's not like you're going to send out a book and all these, you know, famous companies are going to just pounce and want to buy you, right? Pretty, pretty rare. Did you want to chime in or should I move on to the next one? You can move on. Okay. Uh, So I have two questions that are basically intertwined. Uh, This black box of stock options and equity incentives after being acquired for each employee. Um, These are questions of just wanting to know more. Um, How, how does it look like? How does it vary between senior team and junior team? Um, when does it all happen? And, and how do you think about the terms, the vesting schedule being three years or one year? Um, so the mechanics would be really helpful to see or hear about just more generally. I can start on that one. Um, in terms of valuing and structuring deals, everything for me goes back to that first question that I alluded to at the beginning, which is what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to retain and doing a deal solely for the talent, um, it's usually very clear uh, with the founder and with the CEO going through their talent, who it is that you would want to retain and for what reasons, because it should be tied back to that rationale, that same thesis that you set out to to do. Um, And that usually means a disproportionate amount of the value is going to go to those that you have that need for to fill that gap. The people that are going, you're going to be buying to build if you will. Um, And look, I think there's lots of ways that you end up structuring and valuing things in the outside world, but inside it tends to be a lot of internal benchmarks that you're looking at. What did we pay previously for other companies? What other benchmarks are there? What are the precedents that you wanna set in the market? Um, Because, you know, there are terms do make it out into the world (laughs) through, through lots of means. And also, are you treating your employees equitably? Right um, on day two or day one, when they show up th- after orientation, are they comparing notes with one another and with other employees? And is there, you know, over what cultural norms are you willing to make these new precedent setting types of terms for people? And that that usually informs everything around deal structure, deal terms, whether or not you're doing cash or stock or RSUs or whatever it might be. All of those things are struck for me go back to that very first question of what you're trying to achieve. Rich, did you want to chime in about, um, that doesn't have to be a company in particular, but in generality of how these incentives play out and stock options. Yeah, I think it's, um, when, it, when it's done properly, it's a very bespoke process really thinking through at the uh, individual team member level, you know, what is this person's former comp and kind of upside? What's it gonna look like post acquisition? Are they appropriately motivated both financially and also in terms of their role and responsibility? And um, in the the two I've been involved with, you know, that was done in a very sort of, you know, individual level, very thoughtfully. and, um, and And it made sense. I think when people try to overly apply you know, formulas or, or, or that kind of stuff. That's when you can, you can miss, miss some stuff and, and lose some folks that you didn't want to lose. But the, the good news is in, in almost all cases, the acquirer really wants to retain the talent. 
And it's a, it's a, you know, it's a big loss for them internally, even if they buy something and everyone leaves. And so uh, this is one where your, your interests are very much aligned and, um, and you can, you know, work together and think it through and, and, uh, but it's pretty bespoke. So I don't have sort of a, an overall, this is the way it works. Okay. But that's really helpful because you're saying baseline in general, acquirers are looking to retain the talent on average, but within the team, there's going to be a varying degree to which certain individuals are going to be more highly valued than others, given the nature of the goals of the acquiring firm. And because of that, it's going to be highly individualized in terms of what packages are offered, what incentives are offered, and so forth. That's right. You see massively different outcomes, even within the same team. You do. I mean, you do, you do end up benchmarking to what Gary said to their, you know, each person would get mapped to the, um, the level employee level or title that the, that the acquirer has if you're being acquired by a larger company and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, it ends up, it ends up being pretty bespoke. Okay. So there's another question coming in regarding the post merger or post acquisition integration phase. We talked about culture, cultural clash, cultural integration. Um, this particular question is getting at the role definition. So have you run into situations where the acquired team now their roles are maybe less well defined, or maybe they're uh, assigned to roles that they did not perhaps expect to take on? Are there any kind of confusions that happened over role assignment and definitions? I think that um, just to continue on what, what Rich said earlier, that how bespoke a process is, is so important. Like I, I think acquirers that tend to, or try to have an M&A playbook, if you will, are the ones that are terrible at M&A. Um, if you're not being, or if, uh, on the inverse side, like if you're not feeling that the acquirer is customizing the things, your roles, your definitions, your titles for you to make you successful, you shouldn't do the deal. I mean, like full stop. Um, and I actually like to say that there's, I, I guess a third question that you need to do M&A really well, I, I gave the two earlier, but from an integration perspective, it's a very simple one and a very sobering one that I love to ask, which is what, it, what will it take to win? Um, you know, there was a company that we acquired called LiveRail, which was in the online advertising space. So it was actually, I think, um, one of two advertising deals that Facebook had done before I, uh, I left. And I remember them coming to me, at, the CEO was asking me if they could keep their business cards and their titles the same. And I said, well, um, no, you have to change them to blue and they have to have an F in front. It has to be five rail, not live rail. No, I said to him, I said, what will it take to win? Because are your clients expecting the live rail brand to show up when they're pitching their advertising solutions? And will a VP title, a VP of sales title on a business card open up a door to have us get more revenue? And that was a really refreshing answer for him to hear because then he knew, oh, I just need to keep leading my business. My role is now a product manager. I'm no longer CEO of Libro, I'm a product manager, but my role is the same. My title may be different, but the things that I need to do to win are very much within my control. And I think when you give that bespoke feeling to, to entrepreneurs to know that you're aligned, I think that those deals end up paying dividends and you end up retaining employees and, and all the goodness happens. Um, but that's an, that's one example where I think it was really educational for me to, to find out that having that question that you can take from deal to deal to say to somebody, what will it take for us to win together ends up giving them the right answer and ends up being really freeing. Got it. So having that priority and focus being on value added rather than just being about the formalities, uh, that perhaps may not be that important in the, in the, in the end. Um, so we are approaching our, our mark. This has been really fun and it has flown by. So what I want to do is um, for each of our panelists, just have uh, give us one takeaway, one advice uh, that you would like to leave us with. It could be both from buyers and sellers perspective, whatever is on your mind. So Rich, could I start with you? Sure. So I, I just think to repeat a little bit of what I said, as the, as the leader of a company, um, knowing that an acquisition is a likely outcome to, to, to think about that proactively, identify your potential acquirers, develop relationships with you if you can, um, have commercial relationships with them if you can, and um, that will make it much smoother um, when that eventually hopefully happens for you. And I would say on the buyer side, if you're doing it, the other thing that's really important is um, senior ownership of an acquisition. So 
there will inevitably be things you didn't think through, questions that come up. And it's actually okay if those questions can get resolved relatively quickly. Um, it ends up being not okay if that question goes off into the bureaucracy and the team, you know, the acquired team feels like they just can't even get answers to questions. Um, and so when, when I was at Yahoo, we, we, we bought a company that um, we, we really failed on the, so who, who owns this piece? And it, 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 it led to a lot, a lot of problems. So I think that's an important thing for the seller to look to. So who's the, who's the person who's going to really help us make this a success on the acquire side? And then if you're buying a company to make sure you uh, don't make that mistake. Wait, I'm just, just going to go, I'll just go back to air. Um, make sure that you have as a seller, uh, make sure you have the transparency around that rationale, like why they think they should be doing this. Why should you be getting married? And are you really aligned and collaborating on that alignment as to what you're going to be building together? Um, getting that right will mitigate any integration failures down the road. And I think as the buyer, um, making sure there's not only air, but fit uh, to Rich's point around culture, um, making sure that it's fair, making sure that there is that cultural alignment so that you feel that you're making and de-risking the investments that you're making because as an acquirer, you can't have a portfolio of these things. Everyone should be successful and really developing that empathy through that and making sure that there's air for these deals to survive and thrive. All right, well, thank you both oh so much because you two are world-class experts on this topic and you've given us a lot of good advice and time. So thank you again for spending the day with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Lori. Thank you. This was such a wonderful, wonderful panel. I think it's actually been our, our best yet. And, and for me, uh, a takeaway was that uh, as a business school professor, I'm always telling managers to think about uh, alignment of goals and incentives and structures and the like. And putting two parties together in a deal really just increases the complexity of it. So the, the importance of communication, there's never enough both before and after that really came through in so many of the comments. So I, I want to thank you, Danny, uh, for leading a, a wonderful discussion. I want to thank Gary and Rich for being amazing friends uh, and alumni of Wharton and for spending your time with us. I, I know you both respond to many of our, our requests, so we're very grateful for that. I also want to say thank you to our, our partners from Lifelong Learning. So we've had with us Amy Nichols, who's our director of Life Lifelong Learning and Alyssa Swanson, our Associate Director, and of course, our beloved San Francisco Venture Lab team. So Irina Yen, who's the Senior Director of Venture Lab, Allison Grant, who's our Director of Events, and of course, Sarah Rodriguez and Ali Kranzler, who keep everything moving on, on these events. So thank you everyone for joining us at, at today's Scale School program. Again, perspectives on startup acquisitions, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day. <laughs>